Здравствуйте. Uh, 
pretrial detention facilities. So everything that's been going on, that's been happening to them for for this past month, uh, is is an, uh, actually pressure because the, even the process of uh, detaining uh, Alan Sharkov's uh, Sergey Kubov's door were, doors were kicked in. Kicked in. Uh, Sergey Kubov uh, was uh, uh, detained uh, with a gun pointed to his to his head. He he was also, also he received a uh, slap on the head. So we know that uh, in these uh, frosty weather that's been recently, uh, the, the parcels with uh, warm stuff did not reach them. No, no mails. Uh, just recently, we've had uh, several letters. Uh, virtually all the lawyers, uh, all the all the attorneys, uh, are, they have uh, signed affidavit. Uh, they have signed. They. Uh, so basically, uh, they they are under gagging order, and they they cannot uh, talk to us. Uh, we just know that there are, there is no investigative activities happening to detained persons. So that's it for my part. Natasha will elaborate. Hello. Uh, from day one, we've been shocked uh, by uh, things happening to our colleagues, and we're very, we're very uh, anxious about them. We're, we're concerned about the relatives. So the time is moving on, and we as a team, we've been. So thanks to Yulia Slutska, who is a wonderful person, a wonderful leader, and she put together a great team of amazing experts around her. Those experts are not just uh, prepared, but are also uh, they are continuing uh, the press club's activities uh, further. They're carrying on this uh, this cause. And moreover, the bulk of our activity is still there. Uh, I mean, the Media IQ website is there. We continue monitoring uh, the media, uh, the Belarusian media, in terms of their compliance to the journalist standards. We uh, refute uh, the propaganda of the state-owned TV channels, and we exercise other ways to boost the standards. We continue collection of evidence of pressure against independent journalists and independent media. We have a special project for that. There's a press on the press. We have a special project. I'll, I'll drop the link to it uh, to the common chat in Zoom. Literally this week, uh, launched an English uh, version of Press Club's website to make sure that the uh, international audiences are also aware as to uh, how propaganda operates uh, their MO, both, both in Russia and in Belarus. Uh, we are planning to recruit uh, yet another set of uh, students uh, to our press uh, club academy uh, to resume our press conferences, uh, talks, uh, to continue uh, with our efforts uh, to improve the quality of journalism in Belarus, uh, promote the solidarity of the media community, and uh, we are advocating the dialogue between various uh, among various stakeholders. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Natasha, Nadia. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Marina Zolotova. Uh, Marina, could you please talk about the uh, by situation, what you're up against? Good afternoon. Well, what I can say is that uh, Tutbai has been uh, s has suffered from, if not all the uh, tricks uh, that the government could throw at it, but uh, then nearly all. Uh, so the reprisals are going to go on. Uh, we do not want this uh, list expanded. Mm, however, we know that's happening to Tutbai, and that's a reflection to all the pro of all the processes uh, that are happening to the independent media on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also uh, one of the manifestations of reprisals uh, against the people of Belarus. Right. Uh, so it started uh, back in May when our journalists and other independent outlets journalists uh, started being detained. Uh, first, the guys were taken to the police departments they would hold them for three or four hours. We remember clearly August the 27th, where in Minsk uh, alone, around 30 journalists uh, were brought to Oktyabrsk uh, Regional Police Department. 
of the 47 in total uh, countrywide on that day. I think right away in September, we started uh, seeing not three to four hours detentions, uh, but uh, they were actually imprisoned uh, to uh, multiple days in prisons, so typically 14 to 15 days. Since May 2020, our journalists uh, were detained for have been detained for 38 times. Thereby, in total, 18 journalists have been uh, have suffered. Some journalists have been arrested three, even four times. Well, definitely, we've been subjected to all the issues, to all the problems uh, that the country was subjected to right away after the elections, uh, when there was a shortage of internet access. Two of our journalists uh, were beaten up. Uh, their equipment was confiscated, uh, then it took us a lot of effort to get it back. And then ultimately, several weeks on, well, the, we managed to get our hands uh, on our equipment, we managed to get it back. In August, September, we received four warnings, like a batch, uh, four warnings uh, from the Ministry of Information, which essentially triggered the process of uh, depriving, uh, stood by as a, as a media outlet status. Since October, we were, uh, our, this status for us was suspended uh, according to the court uh, decision. And uh, on December the 3rd, the court ruled uh, to deprive us uh, this, of the status of the media outlet. This week, our complaint uh, was not satisfied and Tutbai was uh, officially deprived uh, ultimately deprived of the media outlet status. But uh, my, myself and my colleagues are appalled by the uh, criminal case launched against Ekaterina Borisevich, who has been in prison in the Volodarsk uh, pretrial detention facility. Uh, she's been held there for three months because uh, she disclosed allegedly the medical secret uh, that caused uh, grave consequences. The Belarusian colleagues are very well aware of this. Uh, appalling situation. I don't think that uh, uh, the foreign colleagues are aware of that in full detail. So I'll just reiterate what happened briefly. Right. It started on November, uh, November the 11th. Uh, one of the Minsk uh, backyards, uh, which, uh, which is called uh, uh, the, uh, the backyard of the courtyard of changes. Uh, Roman Bondarenko was beaten up. Uh, next, the next day he died in hospital. His death is not even investigated, no, no criminal case has been launched. Uh, no participants uh, of the events uh, on that uh, square of changes uh, have been detained. The journalists have uh, carried out their own investigation and, and they found who uh, the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators were. However, the criminal case was indeed filed for Ekaterina Borisevich, our journalist, and Artem Sorokin, uh, the emergency rescue hospital, allegedly for the disclosure of medical secrets uh, that caused grave consequences. Uh, the thing is, uh, Tutbai actually published an article right after the events uh, saying that uh, Roman Bandarenko was completely sober, zero per mil alcohol in his blood. And that declaration that, uh, by the way, was published not just by Tutbai, the information that uh, Roman's uh, blood was completely free of alcohol, uh, this information was spread across the country on all Telegram channels and all, all the media outlets. However, this statement contradicted uh, the position, the standpoint of uh, investigative committee and uh, what Lukashenko said. For that statement alone, Ekaterina Borisevich and Artem Sorokin have, uh, are spending their third month in, in, in uh, the pretrial detention facility. That's the situation we're up against. Def definitely, we keep working. We are in correspondence with Katya, with Ekaterina. She meets uh, her attorney. Uh, our uh, Not all of her mails uh, reach us. We know that uh, there have been issues with censorship uh, on Volodarsk pretrial pre facility, uh, pretrial detention facility. Uh, so there was a break in correspondence, uh, but we uh, write uh, diligently. So some some portion of the, of the mails get through. And Katya is uh, happy about that. It's it's sad that uh, Katya's daughter uh, 
became of age without her mother uh, next to her. She, she was in prison at the time, obviously. Uh, her daughter celebrated her 18th birthday without her mother around. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marina, for sharing this. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Svetlana Garda from Media Palacio. Svetlana, the floor is yours. Yeah, could you please tell us uh, what you are facing? Once again, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I believe that uh, we've been distinguished as the only portal in the country that was punished twice for the publications that uh, caused, uh, quote, uh, the threat to the national security, unquote. So particularly, I, I wish to, say, to tell Marina, so guys, uh, don't worry about losing the media outlet status. Let me tell you about uh, what uh, the entrance into the status meant for us. Media Palacio, for those who are unaware, it has been around for eight years. It's uh, south of the country, the Palacio region, hence the name. Uh, my uh, towns are Lunia, Stolin, and Pinsk. And the audience is the audience coverage is around 100,000 users. Yesterday, there were 140,000 users. Uh, this confirms that our uh, viewership uh, badly wants the local information, policy linked information. Our viewership uh, grew by four times, uh, mostly during the pandemic. Uh, and after the elections, uh, after those uh, stuff that happened after the elections, the aftermath, the issue started back in, back, uh, in early pandemic days. We were held liable for a publication that was completely Well, that publication meant absolutely nothing. Uh, the edit uh, was made uh, 15 minutes after the warning, uh, but uh, the very uh, they only needed a reason. They needed, needed they only needed pretext uh, to attack us. Uh, the local authorities uh, attacked us, and so we learned uh, that we were a media agency because of their complaint. Uh, they just backdated our application, although we've filed six applications for eight months before. And they found uh, minor excuses not to grant us the status. But bam, we get this uh, uh, warning, a caution for, uh, the, uh, pub for, for the publication during the time of the pandemic. And we all really realized that we were ultimately backdated and registered as a media agency. Uh, so if it were a publication from a, a sole entrepreneur or, or a physical or a natural person, it would have been a minor fine, uh, 120 base values. That was around 1,200 euros back in the day. Uh, so we were fined uh, for, for that amount because we were a media agency and uh, not a bunch of individuals. So uh, also because of that, we had to hire people. We had to pay rent to pay the Ministry of Information to register us. And by the way, uh, the base value of this base unit uh, changed. It was increased uh, uh, for these eight, eight months, and we had to pay extra a couple times. So this uh, punishment, uh, this uh, persecution against us uh, must have uh, become a reason for other media uh, agencies not to register for the official status. But our authorities realized that this is a good way of making uh, salaries. Uh, so it's, it's a good salary for a bunch of judges or a bunch of law enforcement officers. And we were uh, again uh, attacked. Uh, uh, there was a lawsuit filed to us. Uh, Svetlana Sikhanovska was born from Mikashevich, uh, was born in Mikashevich. Our correspondent went there and talked to the residents. And it so happened uh, uh, that, uh, uh, well, there, there was a quote. Uh, she followed her husband as the wife of the Dekabrist of the December Revolution in 18th century, followed the husbands uh, to the exile. So we, we changed that uh, quote, but ultimately uh, there was an application uh, filed against us. Uh, from that uh, person and again from, from the person that was quoted and again we were uh, cautioned uh, for a threat uh, on national security uh, the, uh, however the, the court overturned that case uh, because there was no proof and ultimately uh, the apology was uh, given to that person and everything was remedied uh, for, for just a, uh, a matter of minutes uh, there was a different last name it was changed it was ultimately edited. Uh, so our 
police uh, are fond of making money, not just on the 23.34 article of the, of the uh, administrative code. Uh, they appealed uh, that uh, court ruling, court ruling. So in Brest, uh, they did that. Uh, our case went back to, to, our, to our town to a new judge, by the way, the chairperson of the, of the, of the court. And that judge uh, uh, ultimately ruled that we were to be fined. Uh, 200 base values. That's 2,500 euros, give or take. 2,200 euros something back in the day. Uh, obviously, we complained that uh, ruling and we were given a Christmas present in a way. Uh, our arguments were turned down, although our attorney found uh, hundreds of uh, violations of procedural nature. However, nobody actually wanted to hear us. So what does it mean? The first uh, ruling was positive uh, in our favor, and the second one, 200 base units fine, 2,200 euros. So there's, there's no limit uh, to their boldness. Uh, to, uh, we write uh, stuff on Tud, we read stuff on Tudbai, we rewrite, we post, but what, what, what's the region like? Everyone knows everybody, everybody in, in the regions, in the smaller, smaller places. When those law enforcement people come to me and uh, they tell Svetlana, we need an urgent publication, this sort of uh, campaign, this sort of information, it needs to be published. Well, we proceed from the viewership position. If it's useful for the, view, for the audience, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the readership, then we uh, publish it. But if that same person calls me and see, she said, I need to, uh, to come uh, to, to the police department uh, to provide a statement uh, about what? About the campaign that you've held. Well, please uh, file me an application. Uh, will summon me, summon me officially. And they start bad-mouthing me for that. Well, I'm an editor-in-chief. Uh, I'm a, I've, I've uh, gone an extra mile time after time for you to uh, give you some good stuff uh, to, to, to help you. And he said that uh, I will come to you, I will handcuff you, and I'll get you back uh, to, to the police department. Uh, so can you, give, can you imagine that kind of... Uh, threats uh, to someone I've helped so many times. Uh, so they came to my son, who is officially director of our enterprise, where's your mother? And he says, if, if you locate her, please make sure you tell me. So I just vanished. Uh, actually, yes, I, I was, I'm, I'm ironizing now. I'm, uh, it's, it's ironic for me now. It wasn't as funny back then for me. So that's uh, the original history of how it started, uh, the pressure against our website. And uh, it made me realize that our website is a popular one. It's, it's in demand. So what was happening to our journalists? We felt the pressure back in early uh, pre-voting stage, preliminary, preliminary voting, uh, the presidential campaign. We got that uh, media agency status, and we were hoping that we will be able to freely attend all campaigns, all rallies. So we'll go to various uh, voting polling stations uh, with those credentials that would allegedly uh, suppose to, to give us rights uh, to access to official information. None of that. We got none of that. Our uh, journalists uh, were taken by the scruffs and uh, thrown out of uh, polling stations. Uh, then uh, the protest campaigns, protest uh, rallies started. In Pinsk, in our region, south of the country, uh, there was milestone events, huge events, when a group of activists decided to go to meet uh, the executive uh, committee officials. Uh, now the, all those people are uh, criminally prosecuted. Uh, also, our cameraman was uh, detained in... Uh, so uh, all people were detained and uh, thrown onto the ground face down. Uh, so one of the tough guys, uh, law enforcement, came in and says, who, who is from Media Palace here? And he, 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 he got up and uh, he says, me. And they started beating him up uh, with uh, everybody witnessing that. Well, we wouldn't even know that unless uh, people who were seeing that, who witnessed that, uh, uh, they, they told us. And they said that, uh, well, those poli police officers that were beating him up, they said, uh, ah, you, you're such a bastard, you, you're bad-mouthing us in media. So that they were beating him up badly. So he, he still has scars uh, several months afterwards. Uh, so, so on the face, uh, on the body. So 
he's uh, the only cameraman that we had. Uh, other people could uh, do streams, uh, could do some uh, more basic stuff, uh, but they were also detained. They were also prosecu prosecuted. So in total, our cameraman spent 20 days in detention. So that's about how it went for us. So just to reiterate, it's uh, much more difficult uh, to work in uh, smaller places in the regions because every one of us can be followed and we are being followed. Uh, we have target marks painted on our backs. And trust me when I say it, I, I, when, in, in my own backyard, when, when the dog starts barking, I, I get startled because I realized that they can come for me any minute. But uh, no fear anyway, because we're all in solidarity with, with the guys, with the press club team, with Yulia, with Andrei Alexander. Uh, we write about this. We know that uh, we, we write about this because uh, the people in the regions don't know who Alexander or Yulia Slutska are, but we get this information across to them. We, we, we let them know what's happening. We let them know what's up. We publish that on our website. And yes, we also write mails. We write letters. Now, talking about stuff uh, ahead uh, or in store ahead of us, the challenges potentially to be faced, I can say that we have been making alternative uh, ways. Uh, we have been finding alternative IP addresses, domain names uh, to get our uh, media outlets uh, online. But the local authorities simply hate us. They dream to, to shut us down as early as tomorrow overnight. And they say, like, it, well, uh, one caution from the Ministry of Information is not enough for you. The second one will shut you down. But we will keep going until then. So that's it for my part. Thank you, Svetlana. Uh, just a brief intro from the uh, badge uh, deputy chairperson, Oleg uh, Agiev. Uh, Oleg, uh, could you give us uh, the overall situation in the country? Uh, the floor is yours. Right. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and uh, to tell you as to what's happening in the country. I believe that the name of our press conference uh, uh, fully reflects uh, what's been going on over the past uh, six months and uh, well, things still going on in 2021. It's the pressure against the media. Uh, the numbers uh, that the badge has been recording, uh, violation of journalist rights are through the roof. Uh, over the monitoring period previous, uh, we, we, previously, we have never seen that kind of numbers, that kind of, kind of statistics. I will share both Russian and English uh, versions uh, of those uh, statistical reports that we've been gathering and publishing. Uh, those figures allow us to conclude that at least nine journalists uh, or media agency uh, staff are behind bars as accused. Uh, all nine are recognized by human rights activists uh, as political prisoners. Uh, the, the prosecution against them is of political nature. Uh, and uh, uh, representatives in Belarus, stakeholders in Belarus, and uh, representatives of international uh, institutions uh, urge to uh, release them. Ekaterina Borisevich from Tottenbay. Uh, you can see the Bachvalov and Darya Chinsova from Belsat uh, to journalists Yulia Slutska, Sergei Alshevsky, Ala Sharko, Pyotr Slutsky, as well as uh, the represent press club, as well as uh, the former journalists uh, from the state uh, propaganda who, who left, who quit. Uh, they're also, uh, she, she's also under criminal charges. Another person is, uh, in, uh, is also behind bars. Uh, he is accused uh, uh, because he was helping people pay back the fines uh, for, for the trumped up charges against them, for, for the trumped up cases against them. It was also, uh, there was a detention yesterday, but no charges pressed so far. We are following up on that situation. I'm talking about uh, Andrei Dushuk. And it, it's likely that uh, he might be put into the uh, pre-trial pre detention facility, and he might face charges ultimately. Uh, now, other important stats, during the past year, we've recorded unprecedented uh, spike uh, in detentions, 477 across the country, 477 journalists. Uh, out of those 477, 160 cases were August alone. 
uh, after the elections. 97 times uh, the journalists uh, were arrested, administrative, administrative cases against them, uh, short-term prison sentence, uh, two, two weeks uh, normally. We've recorded at least 62 cases of violence used against journalists, at least 62, including uh, with, uh, with, uh, we uh, saw cases where journalists were targeted, actually targeted, they were shot at at uh, rallies, firearms injuries. Uh, several dozens of these uh, 60 plus cases uh, can be qualified as torture or uh, inhumane treatment uh, to people in detention facilities. Uh, there are instances of uh, beating up, severe beat, uh, beat ups, uh, of journalists uh, during the arrest or uh, in the detention facility, inhumane treatment uh, as well. The total number of, of journalists, around 15 of them, are prosecuted criminally that we know of. Uh, the total amount of fines paid uh, was around uh, uh, 60,000 Belarusian rubles. That's uh, S slightly south of 26, uh, 27,000 euros. That's the journalists alone, uh, not not the media outlets they represent. Uh, as journalists, as physical persons, as natural persons, media Palesia uh, told us about uh, huge fines against them. Uh, in some cases, the journalists were not fined, but the media media agencies that they represent as were. Uh, a limitation of access. Uh, to over 50 plus, to 50 plus media outlets uh, of social political nature. And those blockages, uh, they were blocked, the access to them blocked uh, was illegal. No legal procedure was comply complied with. Uh, there were cases uh, of those uh, block, uh, different cases. Some of them were uh, disputed in court. And uh, after that, uh, the, requ this, the request was uh, to, to restore access was granted, uh, but uh, some cases were not so fortunate. Uh, some, some resources are still blocked. Uh, some online resources are still blocked. Four uh, newspapers had to suspend uh, printing their uh, hard copies. And the, well, legally, they are not uh, publishing, so that they're not uh, printing the, the hard copies. Uh, the circulation uh, in hard copies is zero, but uh, they're actually working, although technically they're shut down. Uh, so uh, huge issues against the journalists of foreign media. The entire set of measures to prosecute, uh, to, to hunt for uh, the Belarusian journalists was also applied, uh, those measures were applied to foreign media representatives. Uh, even before the elections, the ministry of uh, foreign affairs uh, suspended uh, the consideration of applications for accreditation. A huge number of cases that have collected to witness that, to, to, to testify to that, uh, those applications uh, actually were coming in, uh, but there were no responses, uh, no, neither approvals or rejections by the MFA to grant uh, the accreditation to foreign journalists. Nonetheless, some of the journalists uh, that uh, did not get the response uh, they uh, entered the country anyway, but they were caught in the street uh, and uh, the, their access uh, was limited. Uh, those uh, foreign citizens who were able to get into Belarus uh, were deported. Some foreign media that had uh, permanent uh, journalists, permanent uh, representation here, uh, they have been deprived of their status in Belarus. Also, there have been out and out cases of torture against foreign journalists in Belarus just for, rec for the record, at least in Poland, uh, there is a criminal case launched uh, against uh, an instance of the kind. Ukraine, not sure, uh, but uh, our colleagues are attempting to file uh, a criminal case uh, in the Ukrainian court. Two Polish journalists uh, that were subjected to torture in, uh, in Belarus in a very severe form. They, they've really uh, suffered a lot. Uh, they are uh, part of the criminal case uh, to, to protect them uh, launched in Poland. Uh, the position of journalists was reflected in a whole number of statements uh, uh, before and after uh, the electoral campaign when the results were voted and voiced. There were politically motivated uh, criminal prosecution against the media representatives. We require, we demand 
immediate release of uh, the nine political prisoners uh, that have been recognized as such, the, the, the prison journalists in Belarus. And we uh, encourage uh, that uh, the government, uh, we uh, urge the government uh, to uphold uh, the uh, responsibility that they've assumed uh, to uh, protect the freedom of speech. The political prisoners are also uh, have been recognized as persons uh, who were promoting uh, the freedom of speech and they were not abusing uh, their status. Uh, this is the grounds uh, the, 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 to, to recognize them as political prisoners. The press club uh, employees, uh, other uh, journalists, uh, they were prosecuted uh, uh, even despite the freedom of association that's uh, part of the constitution. The press club, six persons, uh, they had uh, the right uh, to uh, for, for free association. Uh, so on our part, we would like to thank uh, our foreign colleagues from international organizations who were also uh, the reporters without borders, the European Federation of Journalists, International Federation of Journalists. They were receiving these uh, applications of ours to recognize our colleagues as political prisoners. Other communities of journalists uh, express their solidarity and uh, demand from the authorities of Belarus uh, to release the journalists and to not prosecute them for their professional activity. Hopefully, with our joint combined efforts, uh, we'll be able to stop this torrent of repressions against uh, this uh, against the media community in Belarus. I hope that our colleagues uh, will stay out of prison. Uh, we will monitor the cases uh, that are in court, are about to go to court. Uh, for Bell set, uh, the prosecutor's office received the information. The Bell said journalists, uh, uh, the, where the, the prosecutor already has the file, uh, but uh, we were looking forward to learning where, in which courts, uh, uh, these cases will be heard. And we need to make sure that uh, not just the uh, uh, journalists, but also the broader public uh, are uh, know that uh, there's information they can disseminate the facts about what's what's going to, to, be, to be happening in those trials. Uh, for many uh, criminal cases, uh, the attorneys are forced uh, uh, to, side, uh, to, to, to sign those uh, uh, well, gagging rates. Actually, they are uh, prevented from talking about the nature of the, of the uh, criminal case launched. They cannot respond broadly uh, to criminal cases uh, under investigations now. So because of this lack of information, the, the attorneys at law simply cannot provide that. In our, in our reports uh, that we do on our behalf and in coalition with our other organizations, uh, in our reports we point out that the situation with the freedom of speech was uh, severe uh, in uh, was, was, was quite tough in Belarus uh, before 2020, but it, now it's severe. Uh, many journalists, many media representatives uh, have been uh, actually oppressed because of their activity, because of their line of work. So. I'll provide the links in Russian and in English, uh, the summary of 2020 monitoring, uh, the, the stats I promised. Thank you very much, Oleg. I, I believe that we will disseminate this information. Feel free to spread the word. Uh, we will do the post-production of this uh, conference and we will send these, uh, these links so that you uh, are happy to provide to, to the all the attendees, all the registered attendees. Your questions are welcome to be voiced into the chat box. Uh, some questions are coming in, particularly uh, there is a question from Elena Spasuk, Navina.by. Dear colleagues, could you please tell me uh, what uh, do the authorities risk? What do they lose uh, when they uh, exterminate the free press? Well, I, I believe this one goes uh, to all the speakers, uh, whoever wishes to take the floor first. What do the authorities tend to lose by destroying free press? Well, I can start. Uh, I'm getting this impression. Uh, the authorities no longer care. They don't care about anything. They don't care about image. It's not significant, of no significance to them whatsoever. Yes, uh, uh, there, there is international pressure against the authorities. However, uh, the big question is uh, whether they actually care, whether it means anything for them. Uh, after that craziness, uh, this lawlessness uh, that we witnessed, multiple witnesses, 
uh, and so naturally the entire international community saw what was going on. Uh, the government simply doesn't care. On the other hand, it's also quite obvious that uh, if the media outlets, I mean the online media that we regard as traditional media anyway, uh, only the Telegram channels will, will stay, and so it's, it's uh, virtually impossible to fight those. Uh, the online editions are also impossible to fight against, because I'm amazed and I'm proud to, to watch uh, my colleagues who operate uh, even though their websites have been blocked. Uh, well, first of all, they strengthened uh, their social media protection. Even in our case, in May, uh, in, Telegram in our Telegram channel, there were 50,000 subscribers. By August, we had 4, 400,000, five times that. So the information cannot be hidden in the, in, in the 21st century, in 2021. There's no way you can hide information. If the authorities are trying to uh, hide some information, well, it's impossible to hide it. It's, it's uh, not realistic. Creating the informational bubble for one person so that, they, so that that person feels all right, it's possible. But uh, it, it's impossible to create such informational vacuum uh, for the entire people for the entire nation. Therefore, I cannot really say, well, the authorities are clearly aware uh, of what they're risking there, but they, they simply don't care. They just want uh, the peace of mind for one guy. The beautiful picture is painted for him on, on state TV. There are also other media channels used for that uh, to, to promote, to push that agenda. What the risk, what's, what's happening uh, to, to, to their image, well, really, they don't have any uh, losses to sustain there anymore. Well, I, I agree with Marina. I believe that uh, the loss of reputation uh, simply unties their hands when, when they no longer care, when they don't have to care, when they don't have to look back. The bridges are burned. When the reputation is gone, you can pretty much do anything you please. So can I elaborate? Of course. Well, I second uh, what my colleagues have said, but uh, in the regions, uh, like I said, uh, well, people know each other. It's a small place. And when there is uh, a blow to the image, well, the, author the authorities uh, start uh, trying to uh, close all the information, to, to, to block access to any information. Uh, when there are any last names mentioned in the articles, uh, those officials uh, whose last names were mentioned, uh, they say, or they start bad-mouthing the, the, the media and they say, we'll take you to court. If something is very truthful and it hits uh, those officials, uh, those uh, lackeys, well, they, they all know what to say. We will see you in court. And we have these lawsuits um, filed against us literally almost every day. Uh, the Ministry of Emergencies, uh, well, on uh, January the 19th uh, was a epiphany and the, there was a uh, head of the ministry of emergencies he always uh, gave, gave us comments uh, or first-hand information and he said no you you guys are white red white uh, your uh, opposition we're not giving you anything so this image uh, they're not happy with uh, so th that uh, chief of the local emergency ministry of emergencies department is is no longer talking to us so uh, let me voice my viewpoint. I'm, an, I'm a lawyer rather than a, a, a journalist, but the, the, re the results, the outcomes of the monitoring uh, that press club, uh, BASH, uh, other institutions are holding, uh, that monitoring shows that the official propaganda is used. Well, I, I, I believe it's mean. Uh, those crazy posters that were published yesterday, like the, mimicking the Soviet era, uh, the, they are to be spread through uh, yellow, uh, uh, official uh, state-owned uh, trade unions, uh, they uh, can spread these posters and actually those posters uh, can be uh, accused of instigating hatred, hate speech. So that aggressive propaganda is the only thing that uh, the authorities are granting resources to. All their resources are channeling there. I believe this is their game plan to, to whip up this PR, but uh, the goals that they are about to reach with that, well, I, I really doubt that they, they, they will hit the spot. 
Thank you. A question from Anna Kietmanova from International Media Academy to Natalia Belikova. Uh, Natasha, could you tell me, other press club uh, staff, are they safe? Uh, can they carry on the activities of the organization, Press Club Belarus? Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this question. When the events of December 22nd happened, so those milestone, uh, pivotal event for our organization, we took measures that all uh, to ensure that all key employees that are uh, relevant for our activities, uh, we made sure that they are safe, that they find themselves in a the, in the safe place. So I can confirm that all of them are in a safe place. Uh, they are true to their uh, ideals, to their activity, to their cause. And uh, they are true to their intention and willingness uh, to carry on. Thank you. Uh, there are three similar questions. They are coming from the Western media and NGO activists as to how they can help in this uh, situation the Belarusian media uh, are facing. The outlets and individual journalists. What is uh, more uh, specific that the EU, rather than we protest and so we condemn and so on, well, what, what can the Europeans do? Well, I'd like to take the floor first. I keep saying the same thing. It's important to, to keep the Belarusian agenda, uh, to keep the Belarusian topic high on the agenda, in the international agenda. Belarus should not be neglected at the backdrop of, of all other important events, definitely important events happening in the world. Uh, but uh, we are turning into, we're being turned into a concentration camp. That's a nine and a half million strong country in the, in the heart of Europe. And the ring around us is, is getting tighter and tighter. And we feel less and less comfortable day, uh, day by day in our own country. Belarus is being turned into a concentration camp. It's very important that uh, well, journalists uh, pay attention to that, and they write about us. On my part, I would say that uh, many colleagues come to BASH, the Belarusian Association of Journalists, with a similar question. And we've developed this approach. We recommend and we ask our colleagues uh, to use the mechanisms of the tools of pressure that they have, uh, the leverage uh, for, for their government, uh, government and inter intergovernmental organizations to make sure that the politicians in all contexts, which uh, have really uh, shrunk uh, these days with the Belarusian authorities, so that every politician uh, would encourage, would urge uh, the compliance to the Moscow mechanism rules. Uh, there's a whole bunch of recommendations in the big block on the freedom of speech. There are some overarching recommendations and there are recommendations specifically for the freedom of speech and the Moscow mechanism. I will try to, to, to find a link to that document and uh, post it here. Uh, the authorities of countries and intergovernmental organizations are supposed to follow these recommendations well, to ensure that uh, the Belarusian authorities get this outcry from, from as, as uh, the demands uh, from the entire international community. Thank you. Right. Oleg Rupchenia, Info Courier newspaper. This is the question. Do you have any plans uh, in your uh, editor's offices uh, if they come for you uh, to, to arrest you, to search you? Uh, do all the employees know what to do, whom to write, uh, where to run? If you have such emergency plan, could you share the template on what, what it looks like, more or less? What to do in, in case of a law enforcement comes to visit? Okay, uh, let me tell you in a nutshell. First of all, we have a list of, well, hotline, basically. It's, it's not hotline, but the numbers of uh, phone numbers of attorneys or members of family next of kin. Well, definitely phone numbers are there. So we've been looking at action plans. No, we've been developing action plans for the cases like uh, the, the, the asker was mentioned. Detentions at the rally, uh, how does it work? The journalist either has a few seconds uh, to write into the chat box uh, to, 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 or just to report in the messenger 
uh, to the editor-in-chief that they are being detained and they do that and we start uh, uh, following up uh, we start calling up the press secretaries of the ministry of the interior or we realize that we need to send in the cavalry the the, 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 the attorneys and then we work uh, through them if it's if it's bad if the case is bad if they come visit uh, people's homes our colleagues homes or if that person has a chance uh, ideally they should get in touch with uh, the editor-in-chief or with lawyers if uh, they don't have this opportunity well consider this every editor-in-chief is uh, controlling the situation if uh, the person was supposed uh, to come up uh, to surface and uh, for for a session of communication and that session of communications is is is, is not happening then the editor-in-chief uh, starts uh, raising alarms uh, relatives uh, uh, colleagues friends uh, were, they start calling them the editor-in-chief starts calling them we have uh, the contacts uh, of the close persons and the friends uh, I, I think uh, we, we started doing that since the Belta case. We, we started running these lists. Well, I'll elaborate. We also had a list uh, back in August, uh, the, a mandatory list of the next of kin, of the family, uh, husbands, mothers, sons, daughters, uh, attorneys, uh, all their phone numbers. So when a person is being detained and nobody knows uh, for, for an entire day uh, whether what, what they have been, even the attorneys are not able to locate this information. Uh, we've, we've seen cases like that. Following the experience of our colleagues being detained, it's very important uh, to stay in touch with your relatives uh, and uh, be able to, to render assistance if, if it's needed. Even the financial uh, assistance is very important because attorneys' uh, fees are we know that uh, it, it costs, uh, but the attorneys are necessary. And some professional psychological uh, assistance is also necessary. We've been trying to do that uh, because uh, first days, first weeks after the detentions, uh, the relatives are like high on adrenaline. They're in this combat mode when they're fine tuning these processes of uh, uh, getting the parcels across to, to those detention facilities to the relatives. But the second month, uh, month two is already severe. I mean, they are in much, in, in much less combat ready shape, so to speak. They need support, psychological support, and we work to get them there. So when we were sending uh, the journalists uh, to, 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 to cover rallies, and that was dangerous, uh, those uh, journalists carried uh, the editor-in-chief's uh, assignment, uh, the uh, actual uh, paperwork to confirm the media outlet status, but it didn't help in, the, in multiple cases. We uh, tried to, try to, to talk to the law enforcement uh, who, who, who did not disclose the last names of the journalists detained. Uh, with Alexandrov, uh, there was a situation when uh, they came for him, uh, or we, we, we actually came to the police department and we said that we will actually we will file an application of a missing person report only then would they say okay right this last name is in our database so the, this kind of information is, is required for the future okay the last question uh edition of the polish radio do the ed editor's offices consider the opportunity to move to poland uh, to ukraine uh, to lithuania would that make sense uh, to move their offices No, well, <laughs> yeah, 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 which uh, In a nutshell, you know, for some time, possibly yes, temporarily. Maybe it, it will take the psychological edge off. It's still teamwork. But anyway, when we operate in a small region, we, we're not just working through social media with our uh, readership, we monitor the events. Uh, we get the message across, we give them the news. Uh, so long-term move, it's, it's uh, unrealistic. We need to be there, we need to be on site. I also support this uh, opinion that Tutbay's uh, editor's office must operate in Belarus. Uh, we are a Belarusian media outlet and we're supposed to be in the country, not outside. At the same time, I do realize, I'm well aware of the risks 
and I realize that uh, to maintain normal operation of a media outlet in a critical situation for working purposes, some people can be moved abroad uh, to make sure that the portal stays afloat, just, just in case. Well, th these are my thoughts. We're not a media outlet officially. Uh, media IQ is uh, capable of operation, uh, is capable uh, to operate from any location remotely, and the employee's safety is uh, paramount. So we will do our utmost to make sure our activities continue. First and foremost, we will consider every possible option for that. Thank you very much. I wish to thank all the speakers. Uh, there's a message from Anais Marin. Uh, for your information, today the UN Security Council is holding a topic on area formula. Uh, area formula. Irene Han, a special rapporteur on the right to freedom of opinion and expression, uh, will be speaking, the keynote speaker, freedom of speech in Belarus. You can follow it online, and there's, there's a uh, link right there in the, in the Zoom chat box. I wish to thank all the speakers uh, for attending this press conference, and I wish good luck to everyone, and stay strong. Likewise, stay with us. And uh, get, us, get, get, get your colleagues out of prison as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you.